This is the Investor Connect podcast program. I'm Hall T. Martin. I'm the host of the show in which we interview angel investors, venture capital, family offices, private equity, and many other investors for early stage and growth companies. I hope you enjoy this episode. Investor Connect is a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to the education of investors and startups for fundraising. Please consider donating $100 to the program to help others in their investor and entrepreneur journey. You can find the donate button on the InvestorConnect.org website. Well, hello, this is Hall Martin with Investor Connect. Today we're here with Kate Mitzelmacher, general partner at Block Accelerate VC. Block Accelerate VC is a platform for blockchain products and services to actualize their true potential. Block Accelerate provides them with world class mentoring, go to market solutions, access to peers, developers pool academic evaluation and research, access to markets, regulatory compliance, and funding necessary for them to succeed. Kate, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So tell us more about your background before investing in early stage companies. Sure. My background is, I guess, somewhat unconventional uh, in venture capital world. I did not come from another large venture capital firm and then started my own. I came from a market research firm focused on information technology called Gartner. Gartner works with 98% of CIOs, chief information officers of Fortune 500 companies, and helps them understand technology trends. So I was fortunate to be exposed to a variety of technology trends from 2010 onwards. Blockchain came to our attention early 2014. That was at the time I moved from London to Silicon Valley to join the venture capital and private equity research side of Gartner. And I got to work with some of the leading venture capitalists in the Valley. And it was interesting because none of them at the time were interested or were looking at blockchain as a potential disruptive force. So I started getting involved with it. I bought my first Bitcoin back then, started going to Ethereum meetups, started dabbling with crypto mining so that I can understand this technology a little bit better. And then in parallel to that, I was doing my master's at Harvard in international relations and foreign policy. So I was trying to get my head around a few different government use cases of blockchain, things like voting, provenance of titles, uh, for example, in real estate. And there were some live uh, proof of concepts happening at the time with the government of Honduras. So all of that led me to decide to say goodbye to Gartner (laughs) and uh, start my own fund, focused on that vision that blockchain will become the fundamentally disruptive force, creating trillions of dollars worth of value over the next five to 10 years. And I had to jump on it and invest in it. Great. So what excites you right now? What I'm excited about at the moment is the idea of bringing $300 trillion worth of real world assets on chain. We have seen a number of crypto native assets originate, live, and trade on chain over the last five to 10 years. And there's a good amount of infrastructure that's been built to help facilitate that. But we're at the very early stages of actually having real world brought on chain and originate and be having the functionality of trading on chain in the same way that you can do with, with native crypto assets. So examples of that could be real estate or real estate loans or mortgages or packaged collateralized lending obligations of forms. For example, we just invested in a company called Centrifuge, and they have a number of real-world assets um, pools on their marketplace and you as an accredited investor can go and generate yield against that and it's done fully on chain, which has a number of advantages, one of which is transparency. So you can see real time which loans are being paid out, 
which loans are defaulted, and what's the credit worthiness of each pool in the track record. Another area I'm excited about is the idea of non-existing assets that previously didn't have any monetary value or were not liquid in any way, shape, or form brought on chain and now having that value that wasn't previously there. So I don't know if you heard about the meme economy, for example. It sounds silly, but memes for years uh, were there in a non-monetized fashion. A neon cat is, is one example from back in the 90s, which created enormous amount of value, but didn't have a, an avenue to monetize itself until blockchain. And now we see these markets where these memes are being traded for millions of dollars. And yes, some of it is overhyped and probably will crash at the next bear market. But I think in the long term, we're going to see the rise of new economies that haven't been in existence before. And memes is just one example. Another example is tokenizing sporting moments that wasn't possible before. Or an athlete's career, where now you all of a sudden you can participate in the success of your favorite athlete as a token holder of the smart contract, which ties athletes' revenues to that contract. There's actually a, um, an exhibition happening in Miami at Art Basel starting tomorrow. I'm going to be there. And they're going to announce the launch of one of the boxer's career on blockchain <laughs> in the form of an NFT. So I think that's just the beginning. And there's many other examples, but that should give you a taste. Quite a bit's going on. It is an exciting time in the blockchain world. You see a, lot of, you see a lot of startups and investors in the blockchain space. What's your advice for people investing <laughs> in this sector? What do you tell them to do before they write that check? Well, especially at the moment, it's really easy to get distracted and try to chase the shiny object. And as you can imagine, prices are going up. So it sounds like you can't lose money, <laughs> no matter what is it that you put your money into. But you can. And we have seen that over the last three years, that the market over time adjusts itself to reflect the reality. So focusing on value and fundamentals, I think, should be the fundamental belief of any value-based investor, no matter whether you're investing in blockchain or raw materials. Yeah. Uh, the second... Mm -hmm, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. The second, the second point is I personally found that experimenting with technology before investing in it is very helpful. So my experience in crypto mining was very helpful for me to understand how tech works. There are plenty of ways to get exposure to these new technology applications online. Uh, most of them are retail focused. So you can just download MetaMask and start playing in it. Be that DeFi or NFTs, purchasing your first NFT even if it's not a multi-million dollar people art work <laughs> piece, but something small, will give you exposure to how this works. And I think the third piece is ultimately it's all about people. So finding the right people to back is extremely important because ultimately they will be the ones who bring this vision to life or not. Great. And then on the other side of that table, what's your advice for people running startups? What do you tell that founder to do before they go out to raise funding for their blockchain business? Well, before or after, I think the, the, the first point about chasing the shiny object would apply to entrepreneurs as well. But I think for entrepreneurs, it's easy to confuse the value that they created for the world and the value of of the token or the value of the valuation that investors are placing on their company. And at the moment, you know, things are overvalued. So everybody seems or thinks that they're doing great. I think that being grounded in reality is very important and not to give into the hype. And it's not easy. 
the second point is I see this as we we've have such an enormous opportunity to innovate at the moment and innovate not just in terms of technology and new applications, but also innovate in terms of the business models. And there's a lot of room for creativity. So as an entrepreneur, I would encourage you to not be afraid to experiment with business models. Maybe things that worked in the past, like SaaS, software as a service, are great, but maybe there are different ways to monetize on the value that you're creating to the world. And just trying to be creative and not be afraid to fail, I think, is is an important point. Great. Um, well, and I would say that the last thing is similar to, to what I said for investors focusing on the people. I think the same applies to entrepreneurs, which is you have to focus on surrounding yourself with people who add value, be those investors, be those hires, mentors, advisors, customers. The more of those you will find, the better chances you will have in succeeding. So that would be my third point. Great. So, you know, the state of investing, let's talk about that. How do you see the industry evolving from here? It seems like we're in a exuberant moment like we were back in 2017. And we know how that turned out yeah. in 2018. But where we are here today, where do you think it's going? Yeah, I think the best analogy I heard is, think of it as we just uncovered this plot of land in the desert and we've decided to build Las Vegas on it. You know, we just built a few roads you know the first the first uh, people who are attracted to this this city are probably speculators so they came and built casinos and we have these casinos now that are working and working well but there's no highways there's nothing connecting those roads but those things will come so personally i i'm not a huge fan of speculation and i haven't i haven't been in 2017 and i'm not a fan of it today. However, one thing that speculation drove in this industry is the creation of the fundamental infrastructure. What we've seen happen is in terms of the protocols and evolution of those protocols and how they became more scalable was partially because of the speculation that was driving the value on those protocols. And you can view NFTs, which is the new hype or metaverse, whatever you want to call it, as the next wave of speculation, but it's also creating this building blocks for the next layer or for the next wave of applications. So I'm excited about the idea that we're building the infrastructure and yes, speculation is still driving a lot of value, but over time, we're building the foundation for multi-trillion dollar applications to be built. And those applications will not be speculation driven. They will be as things I mentioned, real-world assets brought on chain, enormous efficiencies, disintermediation, and, you know, things that people will actually use, not just to game the market, but will actually use for day-to-day life. And so what do you think is the biggest change we'll see in, say, the next 12 to 24 months? In the next 10 to 12, you said 10 to... 12 to 24, 24 months, months, one to two years, yeah. Well, hmm. let me start with what I've seen in the last 10 to 12, 24 months. Okay. A lot more media attention to this industry than before. Maybe I just didn't watch Bloomberg, but I didn't realize that Bloomberg was now pretty much a crypto coverage company. <laughs> if, you <look> at, <laughs> if you watch watch their episodes on a daily basis, they cover crypto pretty regularly. And I think that's going to continue. The second change that I've noticed since 2017 is there's a lot more quantifiable metrics about protocols and projects in the company. If in 2017, you were just investing based on the hype and based on Kinesian beauty contest, whoever thought that something was going to go up in value, you would put your money behind it. Now you have real metrics like revenues, protocol revenues, P ratios, 
you know, so the industry is maturing and I think that's going to continue to, to improve. And the third thing that I've seen is the talent influx, which is the positive outcome of the, of the hype and the buzz. People are leaving, you know, well-respectable jobs in the financial industry, in the tech industry to join crypto startups, blockchain startups, and I think it's a good sign. What do I think is going to happen in the next 10 to 24 months? Because we are in this exuberant phase, I think it's inevitable that we're going to have some form of correction. I'm not sure if it's going to be as profound and dramatic as what we had in 2018, but I would not be surprised if there would be uh, something of that nature, maybe with less of a downside in terms of fluctuation. And I think as much as it was difficult for us as a fund, because we were going through the fundraising process at the time, it was also good for the industry because it washed out a lot of speculators who weren't in it for the long haul. And I think right now we're seeing again the elements of that happening in the industry. And it would be nice to, to have some reality checks come in. But I think over time, in 24 months, we'll come back and we'll come back stronger. Um, So things that fundamentally have value will have value today, 10 months from now, 12 months from now, 24 months from now. Great. Well, let's talk about your fund. What is your investment Mm -hmm. thesis and criteria for funding deals? So criteria, let's start with that. We invest seed, post seed, and Series A checks. We also have done Series B deals, but that's more of an exception than a rule in our fund for like early stage companies. And in terms of the thesis, if we look at our portfolio, I would probably break it into five different broader themes. The first that I mentioned, which is, I personally believe that more than $100 trillion worth of real-world assets will come on chain by 2030. And I think that's probably a low-end number, probably more than $100 trillion. So investing in platforms that bring those assets on chain, help institution custody those assets is one example. And Portfolio companies in that category are Centrifuge, Pantoro. Pantoro does infrastructure loans and bonds on chain mm-hmm. and a few others. The second trend that we're seeing and the thesis that we have is governments around the world will adopt some form of a virtual currency instead of fiat or in complement complementary to their fiat currency. And that could be in the form of CBDCs, central backed digital currency, or it could be in the form of fully decentralized stable coins. And one investment we have in that is MakerDAO with their DAI stable coin, which is collateral backed uh, stable coin. And MakerDAO essentially is a central bank, de facto central bank for the DeFi space. Another trend and thesis of ours is around enterprise and institutional adoption of blockchain technology to replace a portion of the technical stack in those enterprises. And we're saying a portion of that stack will be replaced with blockchain protocols over the next five to 10 years. And examples of companies there are block apps, which is an enterprise platform for supply chain provenance traceability in the energy markets and in the agricultural space. And we also have an investment in Symbion, which is a platform for financial services. So they work with the likes of Vanguard on the data index problem, among other use cases. So that's three. I can keep going if you want, or I can pause. No, I think that's, that's good. I think that gives us a good idea of uh, the investment thesis and the areas in which you 
interact. Uh, let's let's mm-hmm. talk about the challenges in the space. What do you think is the main challenge the startup in this space faces in launching? Of course, there's many to choose from, but what would you put at the top of the list? Challenges for startups. That's right. If you're a founder, you know you have to navigate the regulatory. You have to work with brand new technology. You have to convince customers mm-hmm. to move to a new, uh, you know, methodology of of working. It's not traditional enterprise. It's blockchain, which brings a lot of advantages, but also brings a lot of issues, performance, et cetera. But right, you're you're very close to it. What do you think the char- the startup that you see out there? What do you think is their main challenge? So it's really hard to answer this question because there's a variety of different startups, even in the blockchain space, and they mm-hmm. have very different challenges. Uh, so what you've mentioned is, let's say, companies like Block Apps and enterprise blockchain platforms, they would have a completely different set of challenges from, say, another company that we invested in called Cornstamp, which is a smart contract auditing platform. But let me try to give a sense of both. on the on the former enterprise blockchain startups, yes, things that you've mentioned, this is a brand new technology, it has scalability problems, it has reputational problems and risks, and it has regulatory risks. Regulatory is less of a risk in the case of enterprise blockchain platforms because they don't have a token. So they don't have to deal with that with that implication. But they still have to convince their customers that whatever the status quo they're using, be that a database, Oracle database, or a spreadsheet, or communicating numbers through emails is, is less effective than, than their solution. But I think it's a probably a common challenge, not a, just in blockchain, but probably in, in software in general. Companies like Quantstamp, which do smart contract audits, they are currently faced with scaling problems. There's an incredible amount of demand coming from rising number of smart contract platforms and applications that need to be audited. And ultimately, you only have 24 hours in a day and X number of full-time employees. So how do you scale yourself? And one answer could be you can scale yourself with building software that automates things. But in case of smart contract audit, there's a limit to what you can actually build and scale in terms of software. You still need people to review the code, verify that the logic makes sense and the economics behind it makes sense. So, so that's another set of challenges. The, on the other side of the spectrum, the token investments of ours, it's like centrifuge. They do have to deal with regulatory challenges. And in case of centrifuge, they made a choice to go full KYC AML route, mm-hmm. which is helpful <laughs> for us <laughs> as an investor. So they, they, even though some would argue what they're doing, which is CLO based asset pool loans are not securities. They only accepting credit investors as their as their investors on the platform. But the token is still out there and it could potentially face scrutiny from SEC over time. So I would say that's the spectrum of challenges varies depending on <laughs> where you sit in, in this industry. But You know, look, there, there are growing pains of any industry, and this, especially the one that's so young is blockchain. Right. And then what do you think is the main challenge the investor faces in looking at blockchain deals? Just the sheer volume of them right now. Um, if we spoke a year ago, I would be probably saying the opposite. We don't have enough deals. And now there's just an influx of deals. So as an investor, unless you are operating as a fund and you have a full functioning due diligence process and team, I would not advise you to try to make your own investments in this space. I would rather have you put your money with a fund or a few different funds, be that venture, 
mix of venture hedge funds if you're more into the trading side then then try to then try to chase deals and make your own investments you're just going to get burned and yes you might get lucky but most likely not well you know there's a lot of subsectors and applications in the blockchain space if you had to pick one or two that are really good opportunities to pursue in today's market what would you call out if we were to assume that we are in the, in the middle of irrational exuberance as we call it and there are you know lots of speculators who are trying to raise money through token offerings which we had in 2017 you know would be very careful about investing in tokens right now as much as as lucrative types of opportunities that will not be there a year from now, I would say I've been there. I've seen that we have a lot of people have been burned in 2017. And I'm not saying not to invest in any, but be very careful and cautious when you do that. And usually things adjust and, and things kind of come back to reality at some point in time. So you will likely have an opportunity to participate regardless. Things that I would have liked to invest in back in 2017, in the midst of the hype that we had gone through, and still would have said this was a good investment today, are things that support the growth of the industry. So things like what I just mentioned with Quantstamp, which is smart contract audit platform. You know, fundamentally, we know there will be more smart contracts and smart contract applications in the next five to 10 years. So the need for smart contract auditing will be there, no matter whether we're in the bear market or in the bull market. Yes, their revenues might fluctuate, but preparing yourself for the next cycle of innovation, that w- there will be a need for a company like that. Another example is a company like Zenledger that we invested in. It's a cryptocurrency tax software company. We know that compliance and tax reporting is very, very low right now. And it is just a matter of time before that number is going to go up or it's going to be enforced to go up. So picks and shovels that serve the growth of the industry, support the compliance of the industry, I think will be increasingly important. And I would say you can't really, if you can't find an application that will be the next trillion dollar application, you can go wrong with investing in the protocols because protocols de-risk your investments because they have hundreds of applications built on top of it. So investing in, in you know Ethereum, I would have still been happy even if I invested at the peak of 2017 market at $1,200 per ETH today to, to capitalize on the growth of, of the protocol. And there's a few others and there's layer two solutions that are now coming coming to the market. But those would be the three things that would probably point you to them. Great. Well, in the last few minutes that we have Hopefully here... Hopefully that's helpful. Yeah. What else should we cover that we haven't? I think we've covered quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> I think so I can't too. think of anything right now. Well, great. So how best for listeners to get back in touch with you? I'm on Twitter at kmitzelmacher. You can message me, direct message me there. I also check my email. I try to keep up with it, but sometimes unsuccessfully, and it's kate at blockcelerate.vc. Blockcelerate with two Cs. And we also have a Twitter page for Blockcelerate at Blockcelerate. Great. We'll include so those in the show notes. If you have questions. Yeah. And I want to thank you for joining us today and hope to have you back for a follow-up soon. Thank you, Hall. I appreciate it. Investor Connect helps investors interested in startup funding. In this podcast series, experienced investors share their experience and advice. You can learn more at InvestorConnect.org. Paul T. Martin is the director of Investor Connect, which is a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to the education of investors for early stage funding.
All opinions expressed by Hall and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Investor Connect. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions.